Photography class, welcome to a lecture on biological productivity and energy transfer, chapter 13. Primary productivity is the rate at which energy or organic matter is stored in organisms in the ocean. And photosynthesis is the primary process that accomplishes this. And it's typically single-celled organisms floating in the upper layers of the ocean uh, that convert sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide into sugars, and they excrete oxygen. Another process that uh, performs the storage of organic matter is chemosynthesis, and this these are bacteria that are found in the tissues of organisms surrounding the hydrothermal vents deep at the bottoms of the uh, ocean floor near mid-ocean ridges where there's a lot of volcanic activity. But this accounts for 0.1% of the ocean's biomass. Or, and put it in other words, 0.1% of the ocean's biomass relies on chemosynthesis for survival. The other 99%, 99.9% of the ocean's biomass, meaning like every living thing in the ocean, depends directly on photosynthetic organisms uh, that live at the surface of the oceans. All right, so think of those uh, primary producers that synthesize their own food from carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight as holding up the entire uh, marine life and world's oceans. You can imagine that, you know, that, like picture of Atlas holding up the world, Greek mythology. Yeah, well, those are the uh, single-celled algae in the ocean. So here's that process, the uh, photosynthesis and respiration process. This is a cyclical and complementary process that's fundamental on Earth. So you start off with energy from our sun. And during photosynthesis, plant cells can combine carbon dioxide, water, and uh, to produce sugar and oxygen. Oxygen is a byproduct. Um, but then, um, and then those are these guys right here. This is the phytoplankton, which everyone depends on, all the marine organisms. Um, they photosynthesize, and they uh, create oxygen gas as a byproduct. And that dissolved gas goes in the water, which is essential for marine organisms because they glug, 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 and then they breathe that, right? Um, and that allows them to move. And then they also consume these organisms. And as they respirate and breathe as they move through the, the water column, uh, they excrete carbon dioxide, much like we do, okay? And carbon dioxide, gas, and water uh, are, are then returned to the ocean water, and then the autotrophs, or the primary producers, can use that again for photosynthesis. So you can see that it's circular and cyclical uh, in uh, these two processes of photosynthesis and respiration. How do we measure primary productivity? Remember, primary productivity is uh, essentially just measuring how active uh, these primary producers are in different sections of the ocean and how active they are photosynthesizing and uh, proliferating blooms in different areas of the ocean. And so we can measure that uh, directly by using planktonic nets. Okay, so these are nets with really thin sized seeds that kind of focus the water in this direction. Uh, and, then in, and then here we have a really small sieve at the end of it that collects just a little bit of water and kind of concentrates all those microorganisms uh, and single-celled algae into this little cup right here. And so within that water, it concentrates all these organisms, and then under the microscope, you can see them here. Okay. Um, you can also measure the uh, radioactive carbon in seawater. The amount of carbon incorporated into the phytoplankton that same day as you collect them can be used to estimate the total rate of photosynthesis in that particular region wherever you're sampling. But uh, these are methods of measuring primary productivity in a specific area if you're out there on a boat. 
what how could you estimate it you know in the world's oceans or if we could take a, a kind of a macro view of the ocean uh, the way we can do that is through satellites we can monitor the ocean color with satellites and ocean the color of the ocean is affected by uh, these green pig the green pigment chlorophyll which is within phytoplankton and so that can alter the color of the sur surface of the ocean so Satellites like the CWIFS, Sea Viewing Wide Field of View Sensor Satellite, can collect ocean floor, ha, or has been collecting ocean floor data uh, from 1997 to 2010. The MODIS, Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectroradiometer, um, uh, it measures in 36 different spectral frequencies. So uh, you can collect a lot of different data from that. And uh, what you get are images that show you uh, where primary productivity is uh, most proliferated in different parts of the ocean. And what we found out is that the factors that affect primary productivity, uh, by far the most important factor, uh, well, the two most important factors are the availability of sunlight and nutrient availability. Uh, and the nutrients, uh, these are the, the nutrients that are used by those primary producers, nitrate, phosphorus, iron, and silica, and most of it is delivered to the oceans via runoff from rivers. So what we find is coastal waters are very productive along continental margins because uh, the water running off from continents is delivering a lot of uh, nutrients to the coastal waters. The red field ratio, or kind of carbon uh, nitrate and phosphorus ratio. Um, that is uh, when nutrients are not limiting the productivity of these algal blooms or primary producers, the ratio of carbon to nitrogen, nitrogen to phosphorus or CNP um, in the tissues of these primary producers uh, is called the red field ratio when it's the ideal proportion, which is 106, 16 to one. And it was named after an American oceanographer. Um, and what they found or observed in zooplankton that feed on these diatoms is that the ratio remains the same. And as these uh, zooplankton uh, pass away and plankton, uh, plankton pla pass away, uh, the same amount of uh, nutrients are recycled into the ocean water in the same ratio. <clears throat> so. Other factors that affect primary productivity uh, are runoff of fertilizers from farms. These can wash into coastal areas and cause eutrophication. And eutrophication is the enrichment of an ecosystem with chemical nutrients. So uh, humans are pretty smart. We figured out that plants need nutrients to grow and grow quickly. We can in increase crop yields by fertilizing our farmlands. And we do this artificially. And what will happen is if we fertilize too much, these chemical nutrients can run off and go into estuaries, lakes, rivers. And what happens there um, is this artificially kind of uh, um, causes these algal blooms to run in these areas, which, which isn't necessarily a good thing because you create uh, too much algal growth and too much uh, primary productivity. And when that occurs, then the algae live and proliferate, but when they die, they start um, uh, decomposing. Bacteria start kind of decomposing their um, uh, remains, and that uses up a lot of the available, available dissolved oxygen in the water and can cause a lot of organisms to suffocate that are living within the water column. Another factor that affects primary productivity is essentially the lack of nutrients. If you don't have these nutrients in the ocean water, uh, those, uh, the primary producers won't proliferate and then you'll have no primary productivity. The next most important factor is solar radiation. So the uppermost surface of the ocean and the shallow sea floor are where you see the most solar radiation striking the ocean surface. Um, the compensation depth is where photosynthesis becomes zero or the net photosynthesis becomes zero. And the euphotic zone where photosynthesis occurs is from the surface to around 100 meters, depending on visibility or turbidity of the water. 
That, that's roughly around 330 feet. That's enough light for some photosynthesis to happen. So within that water column from the surface down to about 100 meters, uh, you can have photosynthesis. So any of the organisms that are kind of floating around within this water column, they can photosynthesize. Visible light uh, is a portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and as visible light or as solar radiation strikes the ocean's surface, blue wavelengths penetrate the deepest. And so um, that's why ocean water is blue. And because uh, that light can go down the, the water column the deepest and then reflects back. Uh, and that's why we have that um, kind of bluish color of the ocean. The next color that, that travels the furthest is green. Uh, and that's why in some cases you'll see um, tropical waters kind of have that kind of greenish hue. The longer wavelengths, like red and orange, uh, blue wavelengths are the shortest wavelength, by the way. The longer ones, red and orange, are the first ones absorbed. Here's an image showing uh, the transmission of light in seawater. So here's the electromagnetic spectrum. Of that spectrum, uh, this portion is visible light. This is what we can perceive with our eyes. And then um, all the different colors of visible light have different wavelengths. And the uh, lowest wavelengths, well, second lowest blue, is the one that penetrates the ocean floor the furthest. So you can see that here. Here's a depth of about 100 meters, or 330 feet. And you get a little bit of blue here. All right, so the color in the ocean, ocean color ranges from blue, a deep blue, to yellow-green. And the factors that affect the color are turbidity. Turbidity is just um, how well like uh, floating sediment is mixing with the water that usually cuts your visibility. Like so if there's a river that is dumping sediment, fine silt and clay into the oceans, that stuff is floating around and uh, will cloud the visibility. Okay. Um, another one is if you have a lot of primary productivity, uh, a lot of those primary producers will have um, chlorophyll in their cells and that colors it kind of green also reduces visibility and the way to determine um, like the transparency of the water and you may hear this if you've gone diving or something like that where they'll be like oh the visibility is great today it's 200 meters or so that's measured via the seshi uh, disc and essentially this is it right here and this lady is going to drop it in the water um, and then uh, the visibility range will be how far she can drop it in and still see the disc. Um, <clears throat> other uh, factors in terms of the color of the ocean are whether there's uh, coastal uh, upwelling, the areas that are very productive. This typically colors the water light green. All right. Uh, these are in the eutrophic areas of the ocean. All right. So there's. Um, active uh, primary productivity and then those that algae is um, being recycled and decomposed in l lower parts of the uh, water column. Um, but the ocean uh, the open ocean uh, lacks productivity um, and that's why it, it shows up as dark blue. So I don't know if you've ever gone like deep sea fishing what you'll notice is when you're on the boat and you're in coastal waters you'll notice that the, the water is light green and that's because of that uh, uh, increase in um, nutrients closer to land and upwelling causes a lot of primary productivity. But as soon as you take your boat out to the open ocean, all of a sudden it becomes really dark blue. And oligotrophic means those are areas where there's low productivity, and that's uh, that's typical of the uh, deep ocean. So ocean margins are rich in life um, because of all the nutrient availability because it's shallower and the sunlight can make it uh, to most areas on the sea bottom, uh, there's a lot of life there. But there are a lot of stresses to living close to the ocean margins. Um, some of that includes uh, greater changes in seasonal temperature and salinity, okay? So that the water can get colder and warmer much quicker. Um, the water column varies in thickness due to tides and the changing tides. Um, and breaking waves. That's a really uh, destructive force that releases a large amount of energy in the coastal community. But the ocean mar margins, are, however, are still very productive despite all of the stresses. So here's um, 
a satellite image of ocean chlorophyll, so picking up kind of the green pigmentation in the ocean. And so what you notice is surrounding much of many of the continents, you'll see a lot of uh, this green. So in the northern hemisphere, see all these areas here? Um, they're very light green closer to the continents, and that's because of that nutrient runoff and also coastal upwelling. So superficial waters uh, are moving up towards the surface because of the uh, upwelling, and that brings a lot of nutrients to the surface. Therefore, you get a lot of primary productivity. All right, so surrounding all the major continents, high prim primary productivity. Um, if you notice, too, if you go to the open ocean, just away from the continents in this area, this is kind of a darker blue color, and you see a lot less primary productivity. And that's because they're further away from the ocean. Typically, open ocean, you won't have as much productivity. And then these kind of really green areas here, these are areas of upwelling. So these are great fishing spots because since there's a lot of primary productivity, that's going to attract a lot of zooplankton. And if there are a lot of zooplankton, there are going to be a lot of other small fish to eat the zooplankton. And when there's small fish to eat the zooplankton, then there are larger predatory fish around them. And those are the guys that we go after usually. So upwelling is the flow of deep water towards the surface. And this is an important process. It brings cooler, deeper, nutrient-rich water to the surface. Um, and primary pro productivity is based on uh, the availability, availability of nutrients. So if we have nutrients making it to the surface and it's well-oxygenated water, boom, you get a lot of uh, primary productivity. And this is particularly true on the western continental margins. And the reason for this is because of atmospheric circulation. Remember the trade winds? The trade winds blow um, in this direction and just south of the um, equator in this direction from east to west. So on the western sides of continents, the wind is blowing, the prevailing winds at these latitudes is blowing in that direction. And so that essentially pushes surficial water away from the continents. So think of it as like your arms in a bathtub and you wave your arm in a certain direction and you skim the top water and push it to the other side of the bathtub. Well, when you skim the top of the water away, like the wind is and the trade winds are skimming the water away from the continents, deeper water is gonna move up to replace it. So here's that 3D visualization. Here's the, the, the wind, right? Ekman transport makes the water move in this direction and deeper waters kind of come up towards the surface. And this is where you see that proliferation of life, the primary productivity just explode near the continents. And that's why at some of these areas uh, surrounding continents are great fishing grounds, okay? Here's an example, here's a satellite image off the coast of South Africa and Namibia. And areas of red and yellow and green are areas where primary productivity is exploding. So look at all these areas. And the reason is, is because you have uh, winds coming off the continent, the trade winds moving off the continent in this direction, pushing surficial water out of the way, deep water comes up towards the surface, and then boom, nutrients hit the surface, nutrients and sunlight, you get a lot of biological activity. So upwelling is very important. All right, so let's talk about some of the uh, types of photosynthetic marine organisms that we find in the oceans. Anthophyta are seed-bearing plants. They're the only members of the uh, plant kingdom uh, to belong to the seed-bearing members of that phylum. Um, and they really only occur in shallow coastal areas. Eelgrass is an example of this. It's like a grass-like plant um, and has true roots, but it only forms in, in really quiet waters, bays, estuaries, and low, to, low tidal zones to a, a depth of about only 20 feet. Surf grass also falls into this category of Anthophyta. Uh, they're a seed-bearing plant, um, and they can be found in high-energy environments and on rocky coastlines. Um, you can find other um, Anthophyta in salt marshes, uh, some surf grasses, for example, or in mangrove swamps. Okay, these are all. Uh, all these plants are important sources of food and protection for many marine animals, especially in coastal environments. Then there are uh, micros, microscopic, or I'm sorry, macroscopic large algae. And these are the seaweeds, okay? And they're typically found in shallow waters along ocean margins. 
Um, they're typically attached to the bottom, and a few of the species kind of float above, okay? Um, and they're classified based on the pigment they contain, so they, they're, they essentially have different colors. Um, so they're, they're divided based on their, on their colors so of the different types of algae. And I think I have some pictures. Um, <clears throat> green algae, uh, yeah, how about we just move on to the pictures so you can see it. There we go. Oh, okay, this is Anthophyta. Here is, this is, this essentially are the um, sea grasses here, or surf grasses, excuse me. All right, and then here's, here's green algae. Green algae is common in fresh water. They contain chlorophyll, and that's what colors them green. Um, they're more common in freshwater environments, and most marine species live in intertidal, or they grow intertidal waters, or they grow in shallow bays. Um, they, they're pretty small, moderate in size. They, they rarely grow bigger than 30 centimeters, which is about 12 inches. Um, and there are some species of sea lettuce that uh, fall into this category as well, and they grow in colder waters. All right, then there's red algae. You can see the picture there. Um, red algae uh, are the most abundant and widespread of these macroscopic algae. There are about like 4,000 species of these, and they live in intertidal areas to the outer edge of the sublittoral zone, so they can make it out into deep waters. Um, most of them are attached to the bottom of the seafloor, um, and you know they, some some species uh, are small that you can barely see them with the unaided eye, and others to grow to about ten feet long. Um, you can find red algae in both warm and cold waters, and the reason why uh, they kind of uh, are colored red, um, or it's kind of like a brownish red color, and that's a, uh, essentially because of the uh, the cells uh, uh, with within the the membrane of the plant. Um, they're adapted to receive a little less sunlight in deeper waters to be able to photosynthesize. So um, some of these. Uh, some of these uh, red algae can be find, found as deep as 100 meters or 330 feet, um, which most marine algae uh, can't photosynthesize as, at those depths. Um, the, there's a species of red algae that has been documented to grow into depths of 880 feet. Um, and that's off the coast of the Bahamas. So they're specially adapted to um, uh, photosynthesize and, and very diffuse light. All right, and then there's brown algae, or what we refer to as seaweeds. And brown algae, um, they're the, they include the largest members of attached, um, not free-floating species of marine algae. Their color ranges from kind of light brown to black. Um, and they occur kind of like at mid-latitudes in, in uh, colder waters. The first picture you see there is sargassum. You can often see that wash up on the coastlines on the east coast. The Sargasso Sea is kind of just offshore. Um, like think of um, Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, way offshore there would be the Sea of Sargasso where much of this kind of floats around. Um, yeah, so these, they're in mid-latitudes, colder water. Here's an example of some more brown algae here. Um, microscopic algae, they produce food for about 99% of all marine uh, organisms, so they're the vast majority, even though they're small, they're just so numerous. Um, golden algae, or diatoms, um, let's take a look, a picture at them. They make their uh, shells or tests out of silica, and essentially if, if when they're uh, uh, proliferating and living and dying and their shells are kind of raining down to the bottom of the seafloor. That's what becomes diatomaceous earth and then siliceous oozes. Let's show you a picture. Here's a, a peanut-shaped diatom. This is under an SEM. We would have used one um, if it weren't for the coronavirus. But here's an image of one. Um, this is the casing. So this is made out of silica. These small holes allow um, 
uh, nutrients to go in and their waste to come out. So oxygen in, oxygen out. Um, here's a coccolith. Here are those shades of coccolith. These are much smaller, and they make their shells out of um, calcium carbonate. Okay. So let's see. Um, diatoms come in a variety of shapes. Uh, some of them, this is a peanut-shaped ones, but they're, they're, some of them are kind of canoe-shaped, like that. And others, um, <laughs> sometimes they're kind of hot dog-shaped, which is kind of funny. Um, you can see that like this, and they kind of look like that. So uh, there are over like 6,000 species of diatoms. All right, dinoflagellates, uh, these uh, belong to the phylum of Pyrophyta. Um, and they possess flagella, so uh, they kind of whip their tails around uh, for locomotion. Um, it gives them a slight capacity to move. They're still considered plankton, um, but they also photosynthesize. And uh, their tests are made of cellulose, so they a lot of times they just completely dissolve and are not um, stored as, as um, uh, a seafloor sediment. But what di why dinoflagellates are important is because they cause red tides. These are harmful algal blooms, and they produce a toxin that will show up in, in the water. It can cause fish kills. Um, if you eat or ingest any um, food like oysters or any fish that have uh, been around um, a red tide, it can get you sick too. Okay, let's take a look. These are some... Um, of these uh, dinoflagellates here, come in a lot of ornate shapes. All right, so here's the kind of what a red tide looks like. Um, it, they typically happen in the summer times when um, uh, the water's warmer, and also, it, especially after rains, um, where there's an increase in river runoff into the ocean, which causes uh, many chemical nutrients to go in the water, which causes these harmful red tides. And so these are, we'll refer to them as harmful algal blooms. So natural conditions can stimulate dinoflagellate productivity, uh, but uh, we're exacerbating that by kind of dumping out a lot of um, chemical fertilizers into the ocean. So uh, humans who are exposed to this or eat a lot of fish may get paralytic, uh, a paralytic shellfish poisoning, or PSP. Uh, people have died from this, okay, so that's uh, something to be worried about. Um, please watch this video. It's entertaining. Uh, it's about a harmful algal bloom in Australia. you got to love these accents. Um, so here, red tides typically occur from April through September um, in the northern hemisphere. Obviously, if we're talking about Australia, that's the opposite. Um, their warmest ocean waters would be like February, January. Um, and so dinoflagellates are associated with ciguatera, and that's the type of seafood poisoning. So if you have, uh, like say you have ceviche or any type of uh, other fish that you eat and you get immediately sick and start throwing up, you could have, uh, those, that fish could have been um, swimming through uh, uh, water that had been through a red tide. So that causes the most cases of seafood poisoning or food poisoning after consuming seafood are these red tides. All right, let's talk about ocean eutrophication and the dead zones that exist. Eutrophication, um, this is where we have uh, artificial enrichment, nutrient enrichment of waters that are scarce in nutrients. So it causes crazy, quick primary productivity and harmful algal blooms. And that's because we could have either fertilizer or sewage or animal waste from farms kind of going into rivers or estuaries. Um, and so uh, this occurs naturally um, but it's exacerbated or accelerated by human activities. We call that cultural eutrophication. Um, and that speeds up this whole process and makes it even worse. So what a dead zone is, is an oxygen poor portion of the water column. It can happen at mouths of major rivers because of uh, spring runoffs or uh, sewage going into the water. So essentially what happens, here we go. We've got an estuary, we've got uh, river water coming in seawater, just a little bit saltier water below, nice fish, maybe some crabs, this occurs in the Chesapeake Bay or something like that. Um, but as that river water comes in, uh, a lot of nutrients, so boom, we get this huge algal bloom, and there's a lot of activity. And what we notice here, this green area is the dissolved oxygen concentration in the water. And if you notice, it's decreasing. And the reason why the dissolved oxygen 
is decreasing in the water is because as the algae live and die, when they die, um, the bacteria breaks them down and uses up all the available uh, dissolved oxygen to decompose the dying algae. And so when that happens, that decreases the concentration of oxygen in the water. Now it's down to two parts per million when it was originally at eight. And what that does is create a dead zone. So if any fish were swimming through this water, that's how they breathe. They breathe through uh, converting the dissolved oxygen in the water to respirate. And if there's no dissolved oxygen in the water, they suffocate. So imagine not breathing for a few minutes. That's what happens. And then benthic organisms like crabs or um, nectonic organisms like fish, uh, they'll die as a result of these dead zones. And so there's these huge dead zones worldwide. Um, and they usually are showing up around the mouths of rivers because, like, say, the Mississippi brings in a lot of chemical fertilizers from the Midwest, all the farming that's occurring out there. And so there's huge dead zones in the Gulf, on the East Coast, primarily where there's a lot of population, a lot of sewage going into the water here in Europe and also in China. There are huge dead zones. There are more than 500 worldwide. The Gulf of Mexico dead zone is the second largest in the world, and that's because the entire Mississippi River basin, all this water runoff goes right into here. And here are the uh, dissolved oxygen in parts per million. And these red areas are zero. This is a huge area. Like this is um, uh, like uh, almost the size of, or larger than the size of the metropolitan area of Houston. So imagine being a fish in this water and having to swim for miles just to get take a breath, uh, they would die. Okay, so uh, yeah, there's huge areas around uh, our Gulf Coast, our dead zones. There's terrible algal blooms and there's not much um, dissolved oxygen in the water. Um, there are also a lot of photosynthetic bacteria. Okay, this is more of a recent discovery with better technology. We can see these little guys. And they actually, uh, little did we know, they actually exert a, a really critical influence on marine ecosystems. Um, the most abundant and smallest marine plankton is the Prochlorococcus, okay? Um, at least half of the world's oceans, the photosynthetic biomass uh, is believed to be these tiny photosynthetic bacteria. These are smaller than the diatoms and coccoliths, um, smaller than those single-celled algae, but uh, despite their small size, they're so abundant. All right, so let's talk about regional primary productivity. Um, values of productivity range from one gram of carbon per meter squared a year to 4,000 grams of carbon per meter squared a year. Um, and there's a lot of uneven distribution of nutrients that causes this kind of range and also changes in the availability of sunlight. All right, so not everywhere receives the same amount of sunlight year round, um, depending on where we are in our orbit. Okay. Um, and 90% of the biomass that is forming in the euphotic zone decomposes before even descending past the euphotic zone. So only 1% of that organic matter is not decomposed in the uh, deep ocean. And that's called the biological pump. And that helps move material from the euphotic zone to the seafloor. Okay. Um, subtropical gyros and thermoclines a lot of times prevent the resupply of nutrients to the surface. And that's because Thermoclines are a mass of water, like say that's the surface of the ocean, and here's a layer of water that's less dense, and it prevents the upward motion of nutrient-rich water to the surface because there's an, an area of low-density water that's capping the surface. Okay, so here is um, uh, the three kind of main, op you know, open ocean uh, regions we'll talk about in terms of productivity. Um, Tropical or low latitude oceans go from the equator to about 30 degrees north and south of the equator. Temperate or mid latitude oceans are from 30 to 60. Okay, so just north of Florida, like let's say Jacksonville, all the way up to um, Newfoundland or just south of Greenland. Okay, and then these are polar oceans up here, 60 to 90 degrees. And so we have these two areas uh, in the north and southern poles. Okay, in polar oceans, Polar ocean productivity is great in the summer and not so great in the winter. Um, and the reason why it's not so great in the winter is because of winter darkness. Um, there is no solar radiation in the wintertime in the polar oceans. Remember, they're at the poles, so in the wintertime it's just straight darkness. 
that's not good for primary productivity. However, in the summer, you have great photosynthetic uh, primary productivity. You get huge uh, diatom blooms. And then, so here, here's winter. This is the measure of uh, biomass or primary productivity. And as winter approaches spring, you get an uptick in the di diatom biomass and it hits a peak kind of like in May. Okay, so these are those primary producers. And the reason why uh, this happens is because the, uh, the amount of sunlight increases as you approach spring. And polar waters, there's no thermocline, so the surficial waters are very nutrient rich. So then you get explosions of marine life. Um, and shortly after the explosion of diatom, uh, the zooplankton show up. And the zooplankton show up just a little bit lagged afterwards in July and August is when they peak and then they kind of die down. And the reason why this all dies down, these populations die down is because as summer turns into fall, there's less and less sunlight, and then therefore there's less and less primary productivity. All right, and the examples here are the Arctic and the Barents Sea is where this occurs. Um, Antarctica has slightly greater productivity than the Arctic. Um, and that's because of the North Atlantic deep water upwells near Antarctica. This is water that sunk in the northern pole and travels the entire breadth of the, let's say, Atlantic Ocean and then rises near the coast of Antarctica here. And as it rises, it brings a lot of nutrient-rich water towards the surface. Here's Antarctic intermediate water sinking and then the heaviest and saltiest water sinking right off the coast of Antarctica. That's Antarctic bottom water. But because there's a hole in the ozone layer in the, in the southern hemisphere, productivity is actually decreased because of the UV radiation. So polar ocean water is isothermal, okay? So if you fall in the oceans off the coast of Iceland, you'll get hypothermia fairly quickly. Surface water uh, temperature is about three degrees, and that's true even if you go down to a depth of over five kilometers. It's about the same temperature. So there's no change in temperature with depth. That's what isothermal means. So uh, that's what makes these waters very productive. There's no kind of low density layer of ocean that's blocking nutrients from getting to the surface. Um, here are some copepods. Uh, they're an important zooplankton that show up to eat the diatoms in these polar waters. And a lot of other marine organisms come to feast on these guys. One example are blue whales. Blue whales are huge. Blue whales are so big, think of them as three school buses lined up back to back. That's how big a blue whale is. So blue whales time their migrations to, uh, uh, to the um, zooplankton uh, summer sh sh like uh, proliferation of their numbers in the summertime in the Arctic waters, okay? They're dependent on the copepods, on that zooplankton. So they time their migration for that zooplankton, zooplankton maximum, okay? And they're fast-growing calves. They, they go on these journeys with the calves. Uh, they need uh, a lot of that kind of concentration of uh, copepods in the water to be able to survive, all right? And so blue whales go to the Arctic waters and take advantage of that never-ending uh, copepod buffet of food in the northern uh, waters, and then they start heading south to the temperate oceans. Okay. In tropical oceans, productivity in the open ocean in the tropics is fairly low, and that's because there's a barrier to vertical mixing, and that's the thermocline. The thermocline is well developed in tropical areas, right here and here. Okay. Um, and that's a layer of low density water that prevents cool, cold, nutrient rich water from making it from the, to the surface. So, and that, so the, the, the reason for low productivity on the surface of tropical water is because of the lack of nutrients. Um, the only uh, kind of exception to that rule in tropical oceans is if you have equatorial upwelling or coastal upwelling um, or coral reefs. Coral reefs are typically found kind of uh, closer to continental margins, and so nutrients are being run are running off continental margins and towards that water. So you'll have um, a lot of recycling of those nutrients. Okay, um, and so these are the exceptions where there is high productivity um, in tropical oceans. In temperate oceans, so this is that area kind of north of 
like Jacksonville all the way to up towards Maine. And this productivity is limited by uh, sunlight and the availability of nutrients. Okay, so it's basically on a seasonal pattern. So at temperate oceans from 30 to 60 degrees north and south of the equator, um, during the winter time, uh, you have a lot of nutrients at the surface because there's no thermocline. But the problem is, is there's no sunlight. So productivity is low, okay? In the spring, this is where you get a huge bloom. And the reason why is because nutrients are at the surface, check, right? And also you start getting more sunlight and that's a check, okay? In the summertime, nutrients stop making it to the surface. So this is no nutrients because of the uh, thermocline starts to develop. So that layer of the ocean prevents cool nutrient rich water from making it into the surface. So no nutrients, but you do have sunlight, but that leads to uh, very low productivity because you don't have both of these things. And in the fall, the thermocline starts to break down. So nutrients are there again, check. And sunlight is somewhat there, check. So you get a little small fall bloom there. So let's take a look at this graphically, okay? So here's the wintertime scenario. It's isothermal, there's no thermocline. Okay, that's great because nutrients can make it to the surface. Problem is, is there's no sunlight. So sunlight's very low and sunlight will increase as we approach towards the summer. Okay, so here's January and here's December. So these are the summer months right in here. Okay, that's where you have a lot of sunlight. That's great, so you get a lot of sunlight in the summer, less sunlight in the spring and fall and winter. Okay, so as you approach the spring, which is right here, all of a sudden uh, the, there's a lot of abundant nutrients in the water and you have increasing sunlight. Those two things together cause a phytoplanktonic bloom. Here we go, spring bloom. Bam, it's huge, right, right in between March and April. Okay, soon after that, the zooplankton that eat the phytoplankton show up a little bit lagged afterwards and here's that kind of maximum Right in the month of April is when you have the max of zooplankton. But the problem is the phytoplankton are eating up all the nutrients, right? You have the developing thermocline. So that's an ocean layer that's preventing more nutrients from making it to the surface. So the nutrient supply dwindles. And as the nutrient supply dwindles, so do the populations of phytoplankton. And when the phytoplankton start disappearing, then the zooplankton disappear. And in the summertime, there's very little productivity. So when you're in the dog days of summer, June, July, August, very little productivity, okay? Um, and then as you approach fall, uh, the, the thermocline begins to weaken, so nutrient levels start to increase, and as they increase, you still have sun and nutrients together, you cause this fall bloom here, and then there's another little kind of uh, uptick in zooplankton populations in the fall, and in the wintertime, everything kind of dies down. Nutrient levels skyrocket, uh, but now there's no more sun, so there's no productivity. So, so these blue whales uh, time their migration. They uh, eat the spring uh, zooplankton at uh, temperate oceans in April. And remember, then they continue on northward to the uh, northern pole or um, polar waters. And remember, there's a, a bloom in the summer right here. And then they come back down south and then take advantage of the fall bloom. So it really is like a never-ending migration buffet for these whales that time their, their uh, movements based on the uh, production or primary producing organisms. Okay, so here's the comparison of all the, the different oceans in terms of productivity. Okay, so we have um, the polar, which has that one great summer season. Boom, a lot of productivity and then kind of dies off really quickly. The, the uh, mid-latitude areas that have the spring bloom and then it comes down in the fall bloom. And then uh, tropical oceans, which uh, generally just kind of suck. No primary productivity. So the areas under the curve show that mid-latitude oceans, they have the highest year-round phytoplankton productivity. So if you calculate the area under the curve, they have the most primary productivity. Okay, biotic community is an assemblage of organisms in, a, in an area. An ecosystem is that community plus the surrounding environment. Uh, energy flow through a biotic community and an ecosystem is unidirectional and it's based on solar energy. So as the sun strikes 
the ecosystem, it could be coastal waters or open ocean, uh, that energy is transferred directly from those primary producers. And then those primary producers are eaten by the next trophic level, which are the zooplankton, and then that energy is transferred. Right? And animals expend that energy, and the residual energy kind of dissipates in the water as heat, as those organisms kind of move through the water. So we have the first level in the energy flow in marine systems, which are the producers. They nourish themselves by just floating out and sun tanning out there, photosynthesizing. Or chemosynthesis, those bacteria at the bottom of the ocean near vents. They're autotrophic. They make their own food. Uh, the consumers then eat them. They eat other organisms. We call that heterotrophic. And then once uh, any of these organisms, producers or consumers, when they perish, uh, they're decomposed, and that breaks down dead organisms or waste, and those are heterotrophic organisms. Okay, so here's that radiant energy moving in through, uh, uh, some, you know, there are some species of, of plant that live uh, in coastal waters, um, seagrass and such, uh, kelp, um, and then, uh, but primarily the phytoplankton that live in the upper layers of the ocean. That's where the energy kind of comes into the system. And then chemical energy is transferred through to uh, consumers. And then a lot of that energy is expended uh, via moving or mechanical energy and also heat loss. Okay. And then decomposers are, are, are decomposed by um, uh, when, these, when the consumers die or when the phytoplankton die, uh, that chemical energy is transferred back into the water that way. Okay, what about... Um, eating relationships in the ocean. Herbivores eat plants, carnivores eat other animals, Om omnivores eat both plants and animals, and bacteriovores eat bacteria. Okay, detritus are the dead remains and waste products of any organism. So when they die, um, uh, their material will kind of move down the upper layers of the ocean as detritus. Uh, and that's a way of recycling nutrients because the waste products and um, organic matter from dead organisms can serve as uh, nutrients for other organisms. And we refer to this as the biogeochemical cycle. Okay, nutrient flow in marine ecosystems is cyclical. So when you have algae and plants, they're producing uh, their own food, okay, fixing their own organic matter, food and oxygen. They die, that detritus moves down towards the decomposers, the bacteria, and the bacteria use that as food, expel carbon dioxide, okay. Um, consumers also do the same, but they, uh, they consume the producers and then they also, they die, they expel CO2 as a waste product and then their detritus kind of comes down. And as these organisms are decomposed in deeper waters, that dissolved nutrients, nitrates and phosphates um, are uh, in higher concentrations in the deep ocean. The bacteria here decompose that material and returns that nutrients into the water. And if you have sites of upwelling, uh, those nutrients make it to the surface. And that's what feeds, again, more photosynthesis. And then you can see we've kind of drawn a big circle. And that's why it's cyclical. So many marine organisms have developed many different feeding strategies, OK? Um, suspension feeding is one of them, or filter feeding. That is uh, kind of taking in seawater and filtering, filtering out any usable organic matter. Here you can see um, barnacles filter feeding. These are shelled organisms that attach to hard surfaces and they filter by using those feathery legs to strain microscopic food particles from the seawater. Um, then there's uh, deposit feeding. This is the taking in of detritus material along with sediment and then extracting any usable organic matter in the water. Here you can see a lugworm um, that is kind of moving its way through the sand. All right, that's right here. Um, looks like some alien creature just moving or consuming the sand and just filtering out any organic material that happens to be the sand and that travels through its entire body and is processed, nice word to use there, and cast out in, onto the seafloor. Here's a mole crab. They use their antenna for filter feeding. Um, clams, all right, clams use... Uh, they kind of siphon in water, take out any um, organic material that, or detritus that they can use, and expel it out. Okay, uh, 
That's also uh, suspension feeding. Deposit feeding is like the, uh, the lugworm over here. Then there's carnivorous feeding, and this is when um, an animal, animal uh, will capture and eat other animals. So here is an example of one, uh, a sand star which actively see seeks a prey like a clam. So it just attaches to it and pries it open and eats it up. So trophic levels, uh, I've mentioned this before, I guess I never really explained it, but they're just different feeding stages. And chemical energy is transferred from producers that are kind of sustaining all marine life. And that energy, uh, it, they convert, the efficiency is about 2%. So 2% of the solar energy is converted to these producers. And then every other trophic level beyond that, the consumers, about 10% of that energy is transferred to the next trophic level. Okay, so that means that each feeding population uh, is slightly um, larger than the consuming population. Okay. Uh, that in, in general, the exception is the blue whale, but the blue whales kind of skip a few trophic levels and go right to the zooplankton, skipping the other organisms in between. And they feed on krill, which are pretty small. Okay, But in terms of biomass, the producers make up the majority of the biomass. If you look at this, it's kind of like a pyramid. And here's the energy, energy being transferred uh, to the next trophic level. So these are eaten by most herbivores, right? They're herbivores because they're eating algae. Right? This is like the grass, and these are the cows, and then um, other organisms uh, like carnivores are uh, uh, much less abundant um, in terms of biomass when you compare them to the herbivores and the producers. All right, so only about 10% uh, of the energy transfers in between each feeding stage. Um, and then here's the flow efficiency I talked about. It. If you have 500,000 units of radiant energy, only 2% of that is converted to those primary producers. Trophic level number one. Uh, when you go to trophic level number two, when the zooplankton feed on the uh, phytoplankton, only 10% of that energy is transferred and biomass is also decreased. Uh, and then the next feeding stage, number three, we can call these like herrings or anchovies that eat the small plankton. 10% um, of that energy is transferred over, and this population is slightly smaller or smaller in terms of biomass compared to the zooplankton. And then here are the larger fish. Again, 10% is transferred here. Then the top predators, only 10% is transferred to them and us. We are considered top predator. Only 10% efficiency of energy is transferred. And that's why um, these populations must be smaller in terms of biomass when you're at the top of the food. Food chains, uh, this is where uh, kind of direct feeding relationships amongst the di different organisms, okay? Uh, one example, this is a, a food chain. You have diatoms, they're eaten by copepods, uh, and copepods are eaten by the Newfound Newfoundland herring, okay? Um, but a food web kind of shows a, a better relationship amongst all the organisms in the water. Um, so diatoms and dinoflagellates are those primary producers. They're eaten by a bunch of different zooplankton, tunicates, copepods, mollusks, larvae, arrowworms, sand eels, and it kind of moves up different chains. And this shows kind of a more dynamic, complex web of uh, uh, feeding relationships to the uh, North Sea herring. So it's a really a branching network of many different consumers. It gives a better idea of what's actually going on. Um, and then I've talked about the biomass pyramid at the bottom, the largest primary producers. Uh, they're uh, together 10,000 times the mass of the top predator, like a mako shark. But each trophic level has an increase, or I'm sorry, a decrease in biomass, but each lower trophic level is larger than the one above it. Okay. So typically organisms increase in size as you go up the pyramid. There are some exceptions. All right, let's talk about marine fisheries. Um, this is where uh, we get most of our commercial fishing. They occur on the continental shelves. More than 20% of the uh, marine fisheries uh, occur in areas of upwelling, okay? And that only makes up 0.1% of the surface area. So here, here's that upwelling areas, about 21%. Um, tropical shells, uh, non-tropical shells at 36%. And very little fishing occurs in the open ocean. And that's because primary productivity is low out there.
Um, overfishing is a term used uh, to describe if you're harvesting too much fish stock too rapidly. And what happens is you have a, a, a population of or, uh, fish in the ocean, right? We call that a standing stock, a good uh, herd, let's say, of fish. Um, and that's the mass present in the ecosystem at any given time. And so if you overfish, that means you harvest too much of the standing stock so that the, so that the uh, replacement generation is diminished, okay? Meaning that you take out so many reproducing adults that the, the adults left over and the juveniles, when they reproduce to replace the population, the population actually gets smaller. So you're reducing the standing stock in a given area at a given time. And so what, uh, what this has led to is the understanding of the maximum sustainable yield. And the MSY, what that means is that's the maximum amount of fish you can extract from the oceans to ensure that the population will rebound the same amount. So it's kind of like you can take this many fish, a, a certain amount, and next year the same amount of standing stock will be present. And that's sustainable, meaning that like you could do this uh, in, infinitely because the populations will always replace themselves. Okay, but the problem is um, a lot of marine fisheries and a lot of marine fish are being exploited, meaning that they're o being overfished. And so, uh, and this is what's pretty sad. Uh, fish that are being underexploited or untouched is only 2% of the fish species. Moderately exploited, uh, meaning that it's safe to increase the catch. So you can go out and fish more of these, only 18% of the population. But 52% of the uh, fish populations are fully exploded, meaning that it's not safe to go out and catch more of this fish because you're going to continue to deplete their uh, standing stock uh, as a result. 18% are overexploited and their populations are diminish, diminishing rapidly. 9% are uh, completely depleted and only 1% are recovering. So overfishing, 80% of the 523 world marine fish stocks are fully exploited, 80%. Or I'm sorry, overexploited, exploited, or depleted slash recovering. Um, and it's mostly large predatory fish that have been reduced, okay? And so uh, there's an increasing demand for fish and fish production, and they're decreasing stock. That's not good. Look at this. Uh, since 1950, this is the fish catch per million metric tons, and this is the year. Okay, so the data goes up to 2010. Um, and so the fish catch has been increasing steadily throughout the 50s into the 60s. It hit a maximum in about 1988, meaning that right here we got 80 metric tons of fish catch in global markets. Okay, that was the peak of the global market in terms of fish catch. Um, now, the problem with that is that since 1988, the fishing technology has improved. We've got a lot better at fishing. However, the global catch has decreased by 18%. So we're still going out with more boats and better technology to catch these fish, and yet the catch has decreased. That just tells us that there are fewer fish in the sea. Right? There are fewer of our commercially friendly fish that we eat in the sea because we've essentially overfished them. Another sad term to learn about is incidental catch or bycatch. This is non-commercial species that are accidentally taken up by commercial fishermen. Um, and, and sometimes the catch itself may be eight times more likely than the intended catch. And what happens is you're, when you're trying to catch tuna, for example, you might pull up dolphin, shark, or turtles, and, and they may die in the process of, of uh, catching the, the, uh, the fish that you actually wanted to get. Um, in the wild, tuna and dolphin often kind of uh, fl uh, like herd together as they look for prey. And so... Um, They've been caught in these purse nets, uh, and uh, when this first started occurring, um, people didn't really care. Fishermen didn't care. They just let the dolphin die and just threw them overboard as incidental catch. Oh, well, sorry, didn't mean to kill that dolphin. But slowly, people started to record this um, 
behavior and started to share it to the world. And uh, uh, that drove some, uh, some movement. Um, and there, the Marine Mammals Protection Act uh, was created to help protect the dolphins from inc incidental catch from using those uh, drift nets or purse nets. Okay. Um, and so drift nets or gill nets, as they referred to, uh, they were banned by 1989, which was a great victory. Okay, here's some examples. Um, here is a, um, a, a trawl net right here. So you kind of uh, trawl this at the bottom of the seafloor. Uh, these are those gill nets that you just set up in certain areas to catch fish that, that just get stuck in the net. Um, these are seafloor traps for lobsters, okay? Here are long lines where you can catch fish this way. And then this here is the purse net where you kind of corral a school of fish together and slowly enclose them and then pull them onto your boat. Okay. So commercial fisher, fishing has been aided by uh, satellite tracking and sonar to find different populations. Also uh, airplane spotters. Okay. Uh, but there is a movement for more uh, aquaculture in bays. And so this is almost like fish farming. So fisheries management is um, a way to kind of manage um, the different uh, areas where you can find these uh, the fish that are commercially um, ex exploited from the ocean. Um, it's intended to regulate the fishing because at our current rates, um, there won't be any fish left in the ocean if we continue to fully exploit them. Um, the problem with uh, fisheries management is that they, they'll have conflicting interests. Uh, sometimes the fishery uh, management is focused on uh, making the maximum amount of money uh, for certain companies that are fishing, um, and that's not really aligned with um, the health of the ecosystem. Um, a lot of human employment is tied up in this business, so if you're telling uh, fishermen they're not allowed to catch a certain volume of fish, they may lose their jobs, and that's always bad. But the thing that you have to let them understand is if that they continue to fish at the rates that they're fishing, um, then uh, there won't be any more fish to catch, and their production yields uh, will be lower and lower every year, and they'll lose their job anyways. Okay. Um, so the idea is sustainability, having a self-sustaining marine ecosystem where we're allowed to fish and fish a certain amount, but allow the populations to rebound. Then there's a lot of gray area in terms of international waters. International waters, there's, it's harder to enforce any laws, and then people are questioning whose coastal waters are these. If they're not, if it's in the open ocean, then what is it, the wild, wild west? So enforcement is very difficult. Okay. Um, there are a lot of large fishing vessels, and this has been increasing over time. Look, this is not quite exponential growth, but since 1970, the large uh, fishing vessels have increased going out into the coastal waters and open ocean. Um, and governments, uh, for the most part, subsidize the fishing industry. Okay, and this is kind of the silliest idea. Um, for example, in 1995, the World Fishing Fleet, the government spent collectively about $124 billion to catch $70 billion worth of fish. So even if the government didn't hand out money to these uh, vessels to go catch out fish, it wouldn't be economically sustainable to do it. So why do it at all, right? So the Northwest Atlantic Fisheries and the it, as the, the Grand Banks and Georgia's Bank uh, is an area where they do uh, fisheries management. And, and in the U.S. and Canada, they restrict fishing and enforce bans. And because of this, some stocks in the North Atlantic are rebounding. Um, however, other organisms like uh, the cod are still in decline. Okay, here are the, um, there's a measure of the effectiveness of fisheries around the world. Anywhere in red, there's very poor management and the fishery management and local governments have really done a poor job of regulating the fishing in these areas. Um, in the US, we don't really particularly do a great job either. Um, sometimes when it comes to uh, economy and the environment,
Um, a lot of people justify what they do because of economic reasons, but in the long run, it's actually not a good idea. Um, there are some uh, nice stories, I guess, places where there are enforcing and populations are rebounding, but for the most part, Asia is a mess. There's a, a, a lot of overfishing over here. Um, deep water fisheries, uh, this is harder to enforce because they're kind of, uh, uh, you know, a little further away from uh, continents. Um, regulations are few out here. Because the Atlantic cod is in depletion, um, uh, fishermen have kind of gone out to find a replacement fish and just switch them up. You're deep frying them anyways, man. What's the difference, right? So they found the, uh, the, the deep water Greenland halibut as a good replacement for cod. And what they're doing is using these um, bottom dragging trawl nets to do that. And the problem with that is that they do long lasting damage to deep sea ecosystems and the benthic organisms at the bottom of the ocean just to kind of recoup what they're not getting from the Atlantic cod because they've depleted that population so bad. So it's just making it worse. But look, there's some light at the end of the tunnel, okay? Um, consumers can make choices in their seafood. And so we can choose to purchase seafood from healthy and thriving fisheries that are sustainable. Some examples are farmed seafood, like Alaskan salmon, instead of buying wild caught. A lot of people put uh, emphasis on wild caught salmon. Um, yeah, that uh, model isn't sustainable. So if you want to, you know, have a healthier diet and, and include more fish, uh, take a look, do a little research on where you're buying your fish from uh, so that you can support sustainable efforts and not harm the environment. So um, these are ecosystem-based fishery management where they keep in, uh, uh, they either catch as much natural fish so they're not overfishing, so the populations can rebound, or they're farmed. Okay, so this avoids overfishing and depleting the, the seafood. Uh, some examples are tuna, um, shark, and shrimp. Okay, um, climate change has also affected a lot of the ecosystems around the coastal waters where there are marine fisheries. Um, some marine species uh, are kind of like biological thermometers, and they exist in certain regions, right? And a lot of tropical fish are starting to migrate northward as uh, warmer waters are kind of encroaching in uh, more temperate oceans. So a lot of marine fish are being found outside their normal range. And that indicates that there are temperature changes in the water. And that's bad because then that means some of the local fish could die out from uh, tropical fish competition. Um, and so between 1970 and 2006, uh, the catch composition or the number of, or, you know, like what fishermen have been catching has completely changed because of the different migrations of fish due to warming waters, which is crazy. Okay, so here's an example of what's going on. Essentially, the tropical zones are extending outwards and kind of uh, reducing the temperate and, and polar areas of the ocean. So the tropics are expanding and those tropical fish are kind of moving more north and more south to higher latitudes and starting to replace those local species. Um, and then here's a guide, some seafood choices that you can use to make better decisions as, as you go out and shop for uh, fish if you have that in your diet. But here are your best choices in, in green and some good alternatives. Um, over here, this list is a no-no, avoid buying uh, these fish from specific areas of the ocean because they're practicing uh, bad habits and overfishing and depleting uh, the standing stock. Okay, so this is your guide. Refer to this to become a, a better shopper. All right, thank you.